and she has published lots of publications there and signed by so many outside researchers using the tools she had developed. And she's not only our you know, research and professor here, she's also a professor in China, uh, I believe the China Patent of Science. And she also leads a group of students there to do the research. So it, I'm very excited to have Jean to present her work. It's not only combined work here, but also some, I'm assuming she will talk about some works in China too, like the synergy of the two sides and leading this field. So without further delay, let's welcome Jean, and they're excited to wait for her talk. Okay, give her a plus. Okay, so when we uh, 
uh, use uh, three modalities. If, if we just uh, analyze one by one, uh, you could not get those interaction among these modalities. But if, uh, for example, you could only get uh, fMRI, Only get uh, fMRI activation or some uh, DTI tract impairment, and also some uh, SNP, uh, SNP abnormality. But you cannot get those uh, interactive patterns, and this is why we should use a multimodal ferrin that could get you the uh, joint cross information that shows the interaction among those modalities, which cannot be obtained if we use just uh, analyze each modality separately. And also then people will have questions, are you always right when you're doing those multimodal theorem? Uh, well, this using two modalities is absolutely better than the, uh, using animal alone. Is that possible that when you have two modalities, you also get some uh, you know, inconsistent patterns? So we find that actually in those multivariate approaches, we for those two, when we're using two uh, modalities, we usually could get very um, consistent patterns, such as this um, right figure. So you could find, when you're analyzing the same uh, tasks using the uh, fMRI and EEG, you get very similar patterns. Well, also, if you just separate uh, analysis, sometimes you don't know, uh, you don't, you have some errors that you don't know how it's caused. For example, uh, here is a separate analysis if using fMRI only and MEG only that uh, investigates the effective connectivity between those uh, controls and the patients. And here you find that actually fMRI and EEG, because we are working on the effective connectivity, so that is a one directional connectivity. And uh, in these two modalities, this uh, uh, sign actually are totally opposite. And the next, when we're doing those uh, multimodal fusion, since the data were high dimensional, how should we uh, really use the input of this data? And here we usually you know, extract each uh, data types into some features, which is a very uh, simple manner, such as for the fMRI data, from those raw 4D fMRI data, we could extract some task-related contrast map, and also for the residency fMRI, we could get some uh, fractional out map. And also for the DTI, we could also uh, use uh, FA and FD and other measures. And for the structure, we usually use the segmented gray matter. And for the gene, we could also use a selected SNP and methylation data. So these are not necessarily you have to use it, but which shows that by extracting those uh, raw data into the uh, simple space, we could facilitate our analysis in a uh, few of those uh, modalities. And also we can see that, uh, so here this is a trend that uh, when we search those multimodal fusion, two-way, n-way, and uh, some multimodal fusion plus and right, we can show that there is an increasing trend of these studies across these years. And uh, as I mentioned, since we, we also use a multivariate approach, so there are several of them. There are some IC-based method and also some CCA and the PLS based is partially squares, IVA, and also some recently developed a MISA uh, method by our group. And when we um, you know, summarize this data, we could also um, summarize it as uh, symmetric and asymmetric, and how this method will be used. So this is just a um, line of strategy chart and uh, we could have also some review paper that you can read if you want to understand the deeply. And next uh, we will show that how if we use this method to analyze those uh, brain imaging data. So for us we usually use it in the psychotic disorders and we, from this figure you can show that there uh, the function uh, fMRI, DTI and EEG they have different resolutions and different biological meanings. And by using the joint information, sometimes it could provide some complementary information. And also for the psychotic uh, 
uh, disorders like schizophrenia, bipolar, and schizoaffective or major depression, you could see that these uh, disorders have some uh, symptom overlaps and these gray areas. Sometimes, based on this gray area, it's hard to discriminate these uh, disorders uh, clinically. And what we hope is, based on those imaging measures, we could uh, fill a gap by identifying some objective imaging biomarkers that could help the doctor uh, to get some clinical uh, information and also better understand those pathophysiology under those cognitive deficits or how these uh, imaging biomarkers could help us predict the treatment outcome. So next I will give a, a very uh, simple very simple example of how using the MCC plus GIC that is a fuel method to um, fuse those um, DTI with uh, fMRI for the schizophrenia and bipolar. So this is a previous uh, work that we have done. And here I just want to show that uh, by actually separating this uh, data into the spatial maps and those loadings, these loadings you could treat it as how each one uh, component has the weights across different subjects. And for each modality, we could by linear composition separate it into these loadings and spatial maps. And by this uh, A and S, we could understand the brain in multiple aspects. For example, we could see uh, in which brain region how it varies across groups. And also on those group loadings, you can detect if there are group differences. Also, you could use the slowdowns to detect if there are any relationship with clinical measures. And also, the most importantly, we could show this multimodal co-variation, which cannot be obtained in the single modality analysis. And here, this is just some uh, results of that we are combining DTI with uh, fMRI by examining uh, 164 subjects that containing uh, healthy control schizophrenia and bipolar. So this part is showing that on this pairwise group comparison, uh, in both FMI and DTI, which brain part exists, there are loading differences. And also for the specific uh, temporal component, we could see that how this component activation varies across three groups. And those yellow parts are their common ones, but you can also see that the schizophrenia and, the, and the bipolar, they have more activation Based on those loading parameters, we could also check if there are any significant correlation with age, with duration of illness, and some medication dose. And finally, we could find that the identified um, FA tract and the fMRI maps, if there are some uh, spatial touch, and and when we examined it, it uh, did exist. And we shown that uh, here are some maps that showing the effectiveness of those multimodal fields. That is, we could identify some regions, you know, that are remotely connected actually in the function were remotely connected by the uh, white matter track you identified simultaneously. And that is a two-week uh, examination. And uh, to extend this method, we actually can combine from two to n modalities. Actually, now this is a um, low chart if we are using the NV multimodal theory when you combine three modalities. And this uh, this is actually very similar to the two-way. And we also have published several uh, papers based on this method. And also this uh, MCC plus GIC method and uh, some of those multivariate methods that I mentioned has been integrated in this uh, theory IC toolbox, which is uh, our web page. And here is a simulation result that's shown that uh, when we're using those MCC plus uh, GIC method in both uh, source estimation and those loading parameters, we could get uh, a higher accuracy uh, to the ground truth when at different noises and at different uh, source distributions. So previously is 
just a simple introduction is why we should use multi-model fusion. And then next, I will introduce an example of using those multi-model information to help us identify the cognitive imaging biomarkers. So usually we could also call it uh, neural markers. So we know that uh, cognitive uh, deficit actually is a core function deficit in the schizophrenia and also in some other psychosis. Uh, it's different from the positive psychotic symptoms, which uh, could be IP and so on. <coughs> the cognitive impairment usually are uh, non-responsive to the treatment and it could be uh, retained for a long time. And therefore, this is also the reason that why schizophrenia and some other patients cannot successfully uh, re-enter the site because their uh, cognitive impairment uh, is still there and will not uh, occur. And while we marry this cognition, uh, there are several merits. So here, today I will introduce two of them. The first is the matrix. So matrix is uh, launched by NIMH which is specifically used to identify the schizophrenia community deficit, which contains uh, seven domains, uh, from the speed of processing to working memory and social cognition. And by certain equations, it could contain, uh, combine these seven domains into one composite scores. And uh, also, this is the correlation of each domain with this uh, composite score. Based on these composite scores, we could uh, have some estimation of how this cognitive performance of these subjects. And also, in this study, we just want to know that because many of those metric studies were not related to the imaging, they are just a longitudinal comparison between this cognitive score itself, and also only some univariate uh, studies related to the matrix. So here we are motivated to find which brain regions and patterns could, uh, could predict matrix and output or for example, closely related to the matrix, and how this region could vary among the deputies. And here we use the data that's collected from UNM. Here we have 97 subjects, and you can see that uh, the red ones are controls and blue ones are schizophrenia. So the higher uh, MCCP is actually the matrix uh, uh, consensus uh, battery, which is, uh, which is uh, abbreviation of this matrix scores. So the MCCP composite, the higher of this value, uh, the better performance, and we can see that the controls were, skin, were significantly higher than the patients. And also we uh, we showed that because of cognitive impairment, you have some high correlation with pens negative, and we also find it in our real results. And for this data, we actually have uh, three kind of modalities from fMRI, DTI, and the structure, and we extract it into the, uh, here should be found, so the file of uh, FA and the gray matter. So what we want to do is we want to jointly analyze those three kind of data types, and for each data type, we could separate it into some sub-component and the loading for this component across subjects. And then we want to say if any of this loading for certain subjects would be significantly correlated with uh, cognitive score and also show strong uh, group difference. And here is uh, what we get. It's actually for those, uh, which is called the canonical variance eight. Number eight, we could find a, there is a strong uh, group difference. And also, uh, this component was uh, significantly correlated with this matrix composite score. Here is this, compo uh, com this is component uh, looks like. Uh, we could find that actually both, uh, uh, both function MRI and structure MRI have activation in those uh, basal ganglia and subcortical area. And also in the DTI, there are some main uh, white matter tract, well, uh, such as SLF and ATI were all uh, identified. And except it was correlated with this composite domain, we also checked whether this component has some uh, correlation with different uh, domains. And here is what we can uh, we can get. So this part is the uh, function information, and here this is the uh, 
gray matter activation. And, and these are the composite values and how this, comp how this component correlates with uh, different domains. And we could find that both fMRI and DTI have those uh, Salomon stratum and also the VRA and the tension network activated. And these two components also show strong correlation with composite uh, social population and attention on the regime. So the, actually the identified brain regions were in accordance with the domains they are correlated. And specifically we could find some more delicate specific uh, correlation. For example, in fMRI we could find uh, only verbal learning and uh, visual learning system is correlated with fMRI. Well, in fMRI, we do find those uh, IPL and uh, uh, inferior frontal gyrus and some FPG. So these networks, including those uh, vinicus areas, or some language network, was identified in fMRI. While in the structure data, we also find those um, silence network and executive control network, which were only identified in structure and also only structure correlated with working memory and the problem. Solving the means, which shows that actually the identified in each separate modalities will be in high of consistency with the specific domains if they correlate. And also, uh, it's shown here, we, we could find that uh, the identified white matter tract will start uh, touch those uh, fMRI and the gray matter changes. So they are showing some. A spatial co across all these modalities. And so basically, our conclusion is that the uh, salamic striatal and uh, cortical uh, network, which is uh, like a surface, will be uh, especially correlated with those matrix scores. And so the previous example is, uh, is an unsupervised data. So, so it's, it's totally blind. It didn't incorporate any private and then we have some uh, new questions. So if, if we uh, just want to uh, examine those specific cognitive scores, um, could we use in those uh, supervised multimodal fusion methods that can help us uh, get a more reliable and stable uh, signals that could be uh, specifically related to a measure that you want to use as a reference? And then, thus, we are motivated to uh, provide a new method that we are uh, currently working in fusion is reference. Uh, so, so based on those uh, fusion is reference, we could use like symptom measure or cognitive measure or some even uh, gene expressions. So, based on those measures of interest, you could identify the specific brain patterns that related to. And we call this method is uh, MCCR plus uh, GS. It's like multi-set multi canonical correlation analysis with reference plus uh, joint independent component analysis. And here is our motivation. is We want to use those uh, reference measures uh, incorporated into this uh, source separation. How this figure <laughs> looks like. But but actually, it's like when, when we're doing this uh, normal blend separation, we add those um, cognitive measures as a reference to guide those uh, final separation. And here are some uh, simulated data. So we assume that uh, these are the fMRI, DTI, and the structure activation for certain subjects. And for each subject, we have, uh, we have the, uh, shown that it has a correlation with our uh, memory reference. And based on this, based on the proposed method, we should identify that uh, if we could find those targeted components, and then this component should in um, the same orders occur in, occur in different modalities, which were also uh, correlated with this reference. And in this, uh, in this simulation, we can see that by incorporating those reference, we did find those uh, targeted components that we showed that they are in the same number of components. While in the unsupervised method, they could be randomly ordered. And 
also based on this target component, we also identify how uh, this component, their accuracy uh, compared to ground truth in both subject loadings and spatial maps. And here are the pink ones were the proposed method, which is shown a better uh, performance than the other alternatives. And also, um, for those two uh, linkage between those two pairwise modalities, for example, here the true correlation is the black ones. So the method that the more closer to the black ones will be more accurate. And we do find that uh, the proposed method, the pink ones, was the most close to the ground truth and have the least error. And here, except those target components, for those other identified components, we could also show that based on the proposed method, we can get higher source estimation and loading estimation. And also, at different uh, source distribution, it could uh, achieve the same best uh, performance. And the next, I will, uh, I will introduce how this method applied to those uh, real F4 data. So here for the F1 data, we have 100, it's nearly 300 subjects, and uh, it's half a schizophrenia, and half uh, controls. And we also have seven sites. So here you can see that the uh, solid doors were the controls, and the circles were the patients. And the controls have significantly higher cognitive scores than the patients. And here, note that we use the cognitive measures uh, called uh, c mines. So which, which is uh, different from uh, a matrix that we mentioned before, but they are very similar. So for the C-mines, uh, it only contains six domains, unlike those uh, MCCB. So the C-mines uh, composite did not contain the social cognition domain, but the other domains were very similar. And based on the, here we use the C-mines uh, composite score as a reference to guide our multimodal theory. And this is what we found that uh, is we also get a targeted component that both shown the strong group difference and also have high correlation with these composite values. And since uh, because the C mines were calculated according to those MCCB, these two uh, communicable measures were very similar. So we want to see if we use MCCB as reference, could we get a similar green pattern? that's uh, similar to this uh, green pattern associated with C mines. And here is what we use for the UNM data that use the MCCB uh, composite as a reference. And we could see that we get a very similar patterns across two uh, different data sets, but use uh, different but similar community measures, which makes sense showing that the identified uh, brain regions that are closely related to the cognitive deficit could be replicated. And here uh, there are comparison between these two sites. We could find uh, for the structure and the DTI actually there are high consistence, but for the fact they are slightly different. Um, and which may also uh, because that uh, for the semen we actually do not have those uh, social cognition tasks. And here are uh, some integration of these results. We could also find that um, uh, these are the top two uh, correlated domains for each modality. And we could find uh, the CDENS network and the executive control network were also identified in those structures. And uh, these networks were <coughs> highly correlated with uh, those attention and verbal learning uh, domains related uh, to the different functions. So that is uh, one work for what we want to identify in the cognitive marker. And the third work is um, it's like an individualized prediction. Here we want to try to use those multimodal theory to improve our classification and uh, prediction. So this is a review paper of those uh, classic uh, individualized prediction uh, in the recent 10 years. 
actually we reviewed uh, about more than 200 uh, studies. And, and here there are, uh, we could find that for the individualized prediction, uh, the structure of RAM mostly used, and also but the month model was still the third part. And also we could find that there is an increasing trend of uh, all these uh, applications. And here are these figures summarize that what are the total sample size and the final accuracy it obtained. And here are the total sample size and based on this sample size, how many studies were performed. You can find that actually most studies were uh, below those 100 samples and only a few put about uh, 1,000. But the mean of this, uh, mean of this classification is about 180, uh, um, yes. And, but the median, the median value sample is only about 80 something. And here are how are those uh, classification studies across uh, different, uh, different diseases and how this accuracy looks like. You can see that uh, actually most of those uh, for ADHD, MPD, and MCI, uh, most of those studies, their classification accuracy was, uh, the mean is from 75% to 85%. And then next we have a question. So if we have much model theory, could we uh, definitely improve those classification accuracy? So in the most cases, when you're using two modalities, it could get a, a better performance. For example, here, uh, when we combine those five with gray matter, we separated those first episodes by polar versus uh, unipolar uh, depression at a very high uh, curve, at a very high accuracy, like 92%, uh, which is higher than using each one alone. But this is not necessarily true. Especially, um, especially when we uh, when we have different modalities. So sometimes you have, when you combine two three modalities, is not necessarily the, uh, the using three could get the best performance. But some um, optimized combination from two modalities could get a, a better result. But, but this one is shown that when we combine three modalities uh, with fMRI EGN structure, these three could get a uh, highest performance. But this previous one, we could show that only F8 plus green matter could get the uh, highest one, not uh, using all of them. So the previous is some classification. And the next is, um, except this classification, could we use some imaging markers that really predict those continuous measures, such as cognitive score or some um, uh, ratings of the symptoms. And here we actually pro, uh, we recently uh, proposed a method called, uh, it, it's like individualized prediction framework. And based on this uh, framework, this is purely data-driven, we could find that by using, uh, by using the relief F based uh, feature selection method, we could, ex uh, we could realize the whole brain voxel by searching for different modalities. And by combining these different modality measures, we could uh, realize those uh, prediction of continuous measures. And based on these measures, we, we uh, perform a nested cross-validation for all those subjects. And finally, we could get some Rely, uh, frequently occur MRI features that might be used for the prediction. And based on this method, we uh, find that we identified certain you know, function and the gray matter, uh, uh, function and gray matter brain regions and their combination as a network could predict those uh, cognitive score at uh, 0.7, and also we find that those prediction accuracy actually is uh, bigger than 75% for two-thirds of those subjects. And also the predictive ability is improved, is greatly improved after combining two modalities. Combine, uh, if using single modalities, you could get R equals to 0 0.5 or 5, 6 or 5, 7, but when you combine them, you could get 0.7. And similarly, by uh, 
applying this uh, method to a uh, ECT based on the MDD treatment, we could also estimate, you know, how those patients their uh, their Hamilton score uh, decreases after using those baseline gray matter changes. We could predict how these subjects their rating will decrease after those treatments. And so, if this accuracy will heighten, in which might facilitate the doctor for the personalized uh, clinical decisions. So in this project, we actually have a three sites of data, uh, but since the subject number is uh, kind of uh, limited, we only have uh, 38 in the 38 in the UNM's, uh, data, but we also could have uh, UCLA and uh, Langlais and the Jewish. So at these two hospitals, we also get some uh, major depression uh, patients that was treated. ECT. So we have their uh, gray, matter, uh, gray matter images before and after those treatments. What we want to do is using those uh, baseline gray matter values to predict how those uh, uh, de uh, depress depressive symptom changes after those ECT. And actually, this is what our uh, prediction results. And the x axis is a true uh, HDRS changes, and y is our estimation. We can show that in the UNAM data, we actually get a very high correlation. And also, uh, based on those brain regions identified in UNAM, we performed a regression analysis based on those identified markers in the other two data sets. And on the other two data sets, we could also get a high correlation, like uh, bigger than uh, 0.7. And more importantly, based on those uh, changes of the symptoms, we could also estimate if uh, if this um, if this uh, subject was a remitter or non-remitter. So remitter means uh, this subject will be uh, mostly fully recovered after those treatments. And and the non remitter is that the response is not enough for them. And we could find that actually we get a very high prediction for the UNAP data, and this was also replicated in the other two data sets at a high recognition. And this six identified regions is like that. So, including those uh, left hippocampus, uh, uh, inferior frontal, uh, in middle frontal and some uh, pre-central and uh, some uh, supplementary motor area. But um, note that we also perform those longitudinal, uh, longitudinal uh, statistical test between this region, and we find that only two of them actually show those longitudinal change. So which means that the response, uh, the responsive the treatment responsive regions might be different from those predictive regions. And here are uh, some of those uh, longitudinal changes of these brain regions. We could find that in most cases, actually, the remitters uh, show a gray matter increase compared, uh, after the treatment. But for the non remitters, the change was uh, not obvious. And also, we could find that um, you know there there is some uh, intrinsic uh, heterogeneity into this remitter versus a non remitter, and this might uh, lead to their non responsive to those uh, ECT treatment. So here, there are the top today. Uh, thank you. All. This is what we. Do. <laughs>
Thank you. 